my name is Paul White, as she said, and I am the assistant dean for admissions. I am, have been with the medical school for a total of 20, let's see, yeah, the medical school for 16 of the last 20, uh, almost 28 years. And prior to coming to the medical school, I was the director of undergraduate admissions at Hopkins. Um, so I have experience from over at Homewood as well, but uh, I've been doing medical school admissions both here and one other institution since the uh, year 2000. So uh, left and came back. Well, that's why I say only 16 of the last 22 years. Um, I'm going to go through uh, these slides and stop every few slides, but if you have any question, please put them in the chat and I will ask Theodore Campbell to read the questions uh, if it's something that I think I'm going to get to, I will tell you that, that uh, I'll get to it. If it's something that I've covered and it needs a fuller explanation, I'll be happy to uh, discuss it, okay? So let's go to the next slide. So this is a slide I always like to start with. Do you see it with the, uh, it's this class of 2025. Yes. The reason why I have that up there is because we're still working on the class of 2026, right? Um, now, the numbers, can, can you see that, Deidre? We can see that. Okay, great, yeah, all right. I saw the yellow there, so I thought, oh, is she talking? Yeah. Um, so last year was an unusual year, as I'm sure you all heard. Uh, we saw a 25% or so increase in applications from the previous year. And the same thing happened uh, just about everywhere in the country. I think the national increase was 18%, but we knew that wouldn't be sustained forever. That was just because of the pandemic. And in fact, this year, we had about a 9% decrease in applications, which were still ahead of, of the, the previous cycle. So, and then obviously, uh, you see there's a difference between the AMCAS applications and the secondary. Everyone who submits a verified AMCAS application will receive the Hopkins secondary, but not everyone will return it. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, some people will apply to us because of the name recognition. Some will apply because they were told to apply by a relative. Well, you're applying to med school, or why aren't you applying to Hopkins? Um, and then, you know, sometimes reason sets in and they realize, no, I'm not quite a, a Hopkins profile. So that's understandable. Um, the, the trick is to get invited to interview. Um, and it's very hard. Uh, we only accept about or offer about 11% or so, 12%, depending on the year of uh, the uh, people who submit secondaries are invited to interview. So last year it was 525 um, were invited to the MD and the MD PhD program, and I'm on that committee as well, had, uh, they invited to interview 78. This year we invited 475 to interview for the MD, but we increased the number of MD PhD interviews to about 90 or 92. So. Um, last year, we accepted 254 for class 120. You, you may think, why so many? Well, um, we overlap with a number of great medical schools, and we know that uh, they'll have many choices. So uh, to hedge our bets, we always make more initial offers uh, than we um, uh, have room for in the class, and then backfill by using the waiting list. So we did the wait list, and we did use it last year for about 20 or so offers. And they're included in that 254. So the initial acceptance for the MD was probably about two, 197 or something. And we made 23 offers off the wait list. And uh, uh, the MD PhD is looking for about 12 students. So they didn't make any offers. They got their 12, uh, any additional offers. So the class was 120. And just as in previous years, uh, we've had more women accept our offer than men, I think, um, the past six years women have either outpaced the men in the class or they equal the number of men in the class. Um, the UIM is the underrepresented in medicine. Those are traditional um, underrepresented groups, Black, um, Native American, Hispanic, Latino, um, Native Hawaiian, or Native Alaskan. Um, and 19% so is actually excellent. Uh, I would love for it to be higher, but we don't have uh, quotas. So, 19% uh, is considered excellent. Uh, the MCAT uh, score and the GPA that you see, those are the middle 50th percentile for enrolled students. 
Um, and those aren't cutoffs. So we accepted students and admitted students below a 519, for instance, um, on the MCAT and below a 3.89. And there are lots of reasons why that is, but the, you know, roughly though, it's 25% came in under both of those um, uh, markers. So let's see. Now these should be this year's date, but you know you can correct me. Uh, I think the uh, the uh, AMCAS application will be accessible May fourth, and uh, we will have to submit it roughly around May twenty eighth. AMCAS then uses most of the, the rest of that time to verify your application, so we won't actually get into the last Friday in June. Excuse me, in June, which will be June twenty fourth this year. I'm trying to sneak a peek at my calendar over there. Um, so, and then we will start sending out our secondaries uh, soon after. Now, some people, and I'm sure you'll have a conversation with your advisors at some point, but some people think, uh, or they always ask, is it better to get it in as quickly as possible because you can access it May 4th and send it to May 28th? Well, we won't send you a secondary until July at the earliest. We won't start reviewing applications until the middle of July. We don't start interviewing until the end of August, and we continue to interview um, through out um, February. And we, you know, the, the, the most important thing is to get the application in by the deadlines. So the AMCAS application for Hopkins is um, due by October 15th. Your secondary is due by November 1st. Now, those folks who get it in early will get a secondary in July. Um, they will get their uh, if they're invited to interview, they will hear from us in late August. Now, if you get your application in August, um, you will hear from us. Uh, some people are invited to interview who, who didn't need to get their application in until uh, the October 15th deadline. That's fine. They were still uh, competitive. It's just they, for whatever reason, they chose to submit it later. And, and you know, we understand that. Uh, in fact, some people should wait to send their their uh, AMCAS application in because if they're retaking the MCAT, you know, and they did not do well in a previous MCAT and they want to retake the, the uh, test, that's a, certainly a good reason. If they say, uh, I, I'm having this terrific summer experience that I'd like to write about on the AMCAS application or at least on the secondary. Um, so I'm going to wait to send it in. That makes sense. I, I think that's a great idea in terms of well, why you need to wait. Okay. So um, before I go to the next se session, are there any questions yet, um, Deirdre, in the, the chat related yes. to this? Okay. Yes. Right. So, so there's one question, and it says, so is there no cutoff for the MCAT or GPA? Um, they're trying to ensure that everyone is being considered regardless um, of their... That's right. Everyone's considered. Everyone gets the, the uh, secondary application. You know, if we had cutoffs, we would screen the AMCAS application, and some people might not get a secondary. But that's not the case at Hopkins. Everyone who submits a verified AMCAS, and by the way, verification just means that all the information is accurate. Your your GPA has been calculated correctly. Um, all the institutions you've attended are listed on your application and verified by AMCAS. We don't do the verifications at all. But if you don't get all that information in. And they, they will let you know. And if you don't respond to that, then they won't verify you until you do. And there are some people who've been notified in uh, June that they're missing something and they sit on it until September, October. And then they realize, oh, why haven't I heard from Hopkins? Well, because we never got your application. You weren't verified. And then they look through their emails and realize, oh, there's an old email. So we send our, our information to everyone who's been verified. We'll even uh, remind people who submit a verified AMCAS application and receive our secondary that um, they haven't submitted the secondary for whatever reason. So we will follow up just to make sure that this this isn't a lapse on their on our part, frankly, and that um, they are indeed not interested, which is why they're not sending in the secondary. But you'd be surprised that people who thought they hit submit and they didn't. <laughs> so. Awesome. Um, another question regarding the deadlines for MD, PH, MPH program. Do you have that? The MD, PhD? MD, PhD? Um, this question was MD, MPH. Okay. 
Uh, I'm going to talk a little about the MD MPH low later, but I will tell you, we don't have an MD MPH at Hopkins. That's a common um, misperception. Hopkins offers an MPH through the Bloomberg School of Public Health. You cannot apply for the MPH. You can do MHS, but you can't apply to the MPH until you've had at least two years um, either working for an NGO or working in a medical related field or you know, a nonprofit, or you've been um, at least two years in medical school. So that's a separate application. So um, the MD PhD is a uh, joint degree. Someone who's pursuing an MPH, that's independent. That you might wanna call it a dual degree, but it's not the same as an MD PhD, okay. The only two programs that we offer that are joint degrees are the MD, PhD, and the MD, MBA. And yet, oddly enough, the most popular joint degree is the MD, MPH, those students who decide after year two or three, they do want an MPH. But um, you won't see the deadlines on here because the, the, the key is to get into the MD program. Right. Um, we do have one question here regarding the CAR score um, compared to I'm coming up to that. Section. I'm coming up to that. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Good question. All right. We can move on. All right. Okay. So, um, so what are the what are the criteria for admission to the School of Medicine? Uh, these are the, the five most important things to know about it. Um, we look for academic excellence. We look for leadership. We look for service, compassion, and humanism, diversity, however you want to define it, and we look to your ability to work as part of a team. Notice that it doesn't say you have to have a 3.89 minimum or you have to have a 518 minimum. It just means academic excellence, depending on where you go to college or university and what you've done with your um, academics at that uh, institution, or if you're a career changer or if you're someone who is enhancing their their previous academic record. We want to see how you're doing in that enhancement. So, uh, but we don't have cutoffs at uh, the School of Medicine. Everyone is considered, okay? So these are the basic requirements for admission. Now I know you think, well, why does he lead with the MCAT? Well, the reason why we, uh, that's there is because um, until 2020, we didn't, uh, no, 2000, excuse me, listen, 2000, we didn't require the MCAT. So, there were times when I forget to have that little square up there. So we do require, yeah, at one time you could apply to the School of Medicine with your uh, SATs or uh, ACTs, LSAT, uh, GMAT, so, yeah, but now we just require the MCAT. Um, the others are pretty straightforward, a year of biology, two semesters or eight semester hours of credits. Um, same thing with general college level chemistry, a semester of organic chemistry with lab, uh, three credits minimum of uh, biochemistry lab not required. Uh, let me skip down physics, eight semesters, so two semesters of, uh, of physics with lab. Uh, calc or statistics or a combination. We don't require both calculus and statistics. You, if you have uh, you know, six credits in calc, you've satisfied it. Uh, if you have um, three and three, three calc and three statistics, you've satisfied it. Our medical students say that for the most part, they find statistics most helpful. Um, going to that second uh, level, back to humanities, social and behavioral sciences, we absolutely require eight courses minimum in uh, those areas, or 24 credits, however you want to define it. Uh, at Homewood, a lot of the, the uh, non-science courses have a three credit um, max, so that might be, you know, that would be your eight, but if, you know, somebody may be in an institution where there's uh, one course is the equivalent of four semester hours. So that would be six, you see. And if a student goes to a school that's on a quarter system, uh, generally you, you would need to take three quarters of a course for 8.1 credits to equal a two semester. So just you know, multiply that times what's needed for the um, humanities, social, and behavioral sciences. And we do require a bachelor's degree or in either the sciences or the arts or in nursing or whatever, but it has to be a bachelor's degree or first degree. Um, if someone, uh, for instance, though, was, had, had gone to a joint program in uh, BS uh, Farm D, 
that's fine. We'll accept the farm D as their first degree. We will accept AP and IB credits. I have to let you know, I had to fight hard for this several years ago because we had Homewood students who had received IB credits and yet we weren't accepting those, but we have, I'd say for about seven or eight years now. Um, and so they can be used to satisfy the, re the requirements, although we will only accept up to half as many of those as you have. But if you do have them um, in the sciences, especially, uh, we ask that you take at least one more semester of advanced biology and um, in order to satisfy the general chemistry, general, generally if you've had two semesters of organic chemistry or you've taken a quantitative or analytical chemistry, we'll accept that, or two semesters of biochemistry, um, we'll accept that, will, that can be used to satisfy the chemistry requirements if you have AB uh, chem credit, and it's on your transcript. It has to be on your transcript. Um, I already mentioned labs not required for biochemistry. Communication skills are absolutely essential, um, especially being able to write. So at least two of the courses in the humanities and social behavioral sciences have to have been writing intensive. And we define that as having written a thesis, a term paper, several short papers. It doesn't have to have a W indicating that it was writing intensive. We'll figure that out. Although some colleges do that and that's great. But uh, it, most importantly, it has to be within the humanities, social and behavioral sciences. And I know of institutions where you can have a writing intensive biology course because you're doing lab reports. We will not accept that. It has to be in humanities, social and or behavioral sciences. And the other thing we look for is teamwork skills. Um, and that's usually something we, we pick and pick off your um, letters of recommendation. So you don't need a course. You know? uh, we do accept online courses now for the prerequisites uh, as well as pass fail grades because of the pandemic. But we also encourage people that if the, your school's gone back to offering letter grades, then take letter grades because it gives us something to measure you by, all right? Uh, the MCAT, um, we do require that. And even with the, the pandemic, uh, we did not relax that requirement. And some students, prospective applicants misunderstood how some of our peers were using the MCAT, but they all require the MCAT. It's just at a different point in the application process. Whereas we just said, look, uh, um, the uh, WMC, the MCAT folks have come up with a really good way around this instead of um, offering it you know, two or three times a year, three or four times a year. It was being offered initially uh, because of the pandemic 24 times, um, you know, uh, multiple times a day even. So, and then the turnaround time was just about two weeks um, shortened from uh, normally four weeks or so. So the midpoint is 500. It's really bizarre, but it's, if you think about it, it's, 472 to, to 500 is 28 points, 528 down to 500 is 28 points. So 500 is the midpoint. And we will use the highest score from a single test administration. Um, doesn't matter how many times you've taken it. Uh, if if, you, know, if you, you took it twice and the, the second time you actually went down, then we'll use the highest score if it was the previous one. If you take it multiple times, um, we'll find the highest score and use that on your behalf, okay? So the components of the uh, MCAT are chemical and physical foundations of biological systems, critical analysis and reasoning skills, known as the CARS uh, test, uh, biological and biochemical foundations of living systems, and psychological, social, and biological foundations of behavior. All of these subcategories are important to us. Uh, we pay attention to how you do in each of those. And you know, for my money, as someone who was not a science major, uh, although obviously I took sciences, but it was a history and literature major, uh, I make sure that the entire committee um, understands the importance of the critical analysis and reasoning skills of CARS test. Um, you have to do well on that, because that will tell us how it will be in terms of your written communication and your analysis and so forth. So we do uh, pay a lot of attention to uh, each of those, and especially the CARS. Uh, Let's see. And the, yeah, let me just mention this and then I'll go back to see if there are questions. Uh, the AAMC also came up with a number of, of uh, interpersonal and intrapersonal competencies several years ago. One of the people who contributed was our former Dean of Students, Dr. Painter. 
And so there are 15, I've condensed them to these nine because they really work for us um, and just simplifies it for us. Integrity and ethics, reliability and dependability. And these are straightforward things. Of course, a doctor should be uh, ethical. You know, of course, a doctor should be uh, reliable and have a service orientation. And to a certain extent, they, a doctor needs to be social and have good interpersonal skills. But that doesn't mean you know, everybody has to be an extrovert. You know, it's okay if you're an introvert, as long as you can still work with people. A capacity for improvement, it means that you uh, recognize when you've made a mistake and learn from your mistakes. That's the capacity for improvement. Resiliency and adaptability are key um, to success as an undergraduate, but also any graduate professional school. You know, I'm speaking as someone who went to law school, so you, you have to be resilient. Cultural competence. We're located in East Baltimore. We're in Boston. And if you can't handle that and deal with the uh, local patient population, this is not a good place. Um, if you can't uh, work well with others from different cultures in your classes, this is not a good place either. Uh, oral communication, really important. And once again, teamwork. So these are all the things that we look for in different areas of the application. Some in the application, some in the interview, some at the um, in your letter to recommendation. Okay, so that's all considered as part of the process. So Dee, are there any questions before I move on to the There interview? are so many. Uh, yes. There, there, are, there are a lot. Oh yeah, I see. <laughs> there, there are quite a bit. If you there. can combine some of them. Yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'll try my best. Okay, so the first one was asking about AP credits and how mm -hmm. those count toward the requirements. Well, if, you, if, if you've received AP credit, for calculus, and you haven't taken a single math course at, at, at Hopkins, um, that's okay because you have AP credit, as long as it's on your transcript. Uh, same thing, if you have AP chemistry uh, credit, you know, in other words, you had a four or five, I don't know what the Hopkins, if, if they give credit for threes, but um, certainly fours and five, um, and you take two semesters of organic chemistry, chemistry, you've satisfied our requirement. That's, that's how it's used. Perfect. Okay. But this second one is about the secondary um, app essays. They want to know, um, is it advisable for them to begin earlier and if they can find that information on your website? Um, not on our website. And I think that I, I don't see any point to be getting it earlier. The, the, you know, the whole point of a secondary application, well, let me explain the AMCAS application. That's a standard application, much like the common app was. You send it to all the schools you're applying to. Right? I think the average this past year was about 17, 18 schools that people apply to. The secondary questions on our application are more like categories where we want you to talk about things that matter to us. So you get a sense of our values and we learn how well you can handle those values. Um, and that's the point of the secondary application. Uh, that it's, I don't think they require months of preparation or weeks even of preparation. Anyone who can think can answer these pretty quickly and turn it around pretty quickly as far as I'm concerned. I mean, we don't have a deadline. We don't say, please get it into us within two weeks. That's on you. But you know, if you do, great. If, if you need three weeks, take three weeks. Uh, but get it right. Write the answers that you find are meaningful to you and give us some insights as to who you are as a person. And I, I find that when people look at this, these questions online, if they're out there, and I've seen something, um, and they go ahead and answer it. And then we, we sometimes modify our questions and then the students will complain, well, you, this isn't what was on the website. Well, we put it on our website, somebody else did. And that was last year or two years ago even. Okay, that, that actually goes into one of the other questions that was asked. Um, but this one in particular is asking about the MD, PhD applications and the okay. MD mm -hmm. applications. They want to know how are those applications viewed differently or the review all time? The, uh, they, well, they are different because the, you know, the, the committee, the MD, PhD admissions committee consists of mainly a lot of MD, PhD folks and a few uh, uh, clinical people with MDs. And then I'm on it and, and our chair of the admissions committee. Um, and um, they're interviewed by typically about five people. And um, in addition to the, the standard questions that we ask on the AMCAS application, they also have to provide a research essay. And uh, 
in addition to the letters of recommendation we require, they require a research letter writer. So, uh, so there are some slight differences. And if, if someone is invited to interview for the MD-PhD, you'll just meet those folks. But anyone who's being proposed for admission has to be approved by my committee. Great suggestion. Um, do you want to continue answering questions? Because yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so th this person is, um, at, this is a question by Eileen, I believe. Um, and she wants to know about the pre-med requirements on your website. She wants to know if those are um, current or are they different somehow? No, they're current. Why? Is there something that... <laughs> Yeah, they're well, pretty current. I, I mean, we we're all we're I won't say constantly, but we refresh that website and or certainly review it and refresh when necessary. I mean, I just noticed an error today on the website, and we have um, a, the ability to make some modifications. Other things may involve contacting the marketing office. Which they're nice, but it's a pain to have to do that, you know. But there are certain changes we can certainly make. But uh, the requirements that are on our website are current. Perfect. Um, there's this one question regarding, um, and I think you touched on this, AP credits um, for general mm -hmm. chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted to know if your school would require additional um, general chemistry or chemistry requirements outside of biochemistry and organic chemistry. No, no. But, you know, if you have AP chem credit, you can, you still have to take an additional advanced chemistry, which can be a second semester of, of orgo or second semester of biochemistry, or a semester of analytical or quantitative chemistry, or physical chemistry. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, then this question actually follows along the lines of, mm -hmm. if you're taking high school courses, um, would those high school courses that are maybe um, psychology, sociology, also be considered if they were taken as AP? If, it, if they're AP credits and you get credit from Hopkins and they're on your transcript, we will accept them. So if, you know, most people took, are taking AP courses and not most, anyone who's taking AP courses, they're taking them in high school. You're not taking them at, at Homewood, but Homewood will give you credit, right? So as long as we see those, like I, oh, we just admitted someone who shorts some credits in the uh, humanities, social, and behavioral sciences. And uh, he said, but I see you accepted my AP psychology credit. I said, yeah, because we accept it. Uh, the credits because it was on his transcript. He goes, well, then I'll ask my institution to add uh, one other AP, I think it was in literature that he didn't have one there. Well, I said, don't do that, don't do that because that's playing games. Uh, I know your his institution, they limit what you can add. And he just wants it on there so he doesn't have to take another course. He has to take another course. He goes, well, I can't afford to. I said, you can't afford a community college course. We accept community college credits. It's on our website. Uh, people really need to read the websites. Instead, they want us to read them to them, which is not a good thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I think the additional questions that are coming in are for material you'll likely cover later on about some okay. opportunities and shadowing. Uh, well, let's talk about that now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. What, what's the question? So, so th this first question is about um, what are some of the summer opportunities you would recommend um, for students who are interested in JHU? Well, you know, uh, you're not applying to just JHU. So people should, I hope not. So people should be really broad in their, in, in their plans. But we look for students who've had clinical experience. Now, everyone has, has said, you know, oh, it's just difficult because of the pandemic. That was true for about two months back in 2020. Students have, the motivated students who are applying to our school of medicine, and I would venture to guess most of the top medical schools has actually been able to find clinical experience. Um, that means, you know, getting a, I don't mean shadowing. Shadowing to me is like tip, tipping your, or dipping your, your toe in the water, but it doesn't commit you to swimming. I want you to be able to say, this is what I learned from interacting with patients, because you need to, to, to demonstrate your understanding of medicine in the application and in the interview. And if you're just shadowing, that's pretty passive. So we look for something that's going to be a little more active on your part. 
Now, we understand about the pandemic and that some of it has uh, affected the number of hours. Well, that's okay. It's, the, it's not the quantity, it's the quality that's going to matter unless the quantity is so small. Because uh, I will be the one who says, well, that's only 50 hours over four years. That's nothing, you know. And I know that our, our top students do far more than that, the ones who, who get in and come. So, um, but I think, uh, uh, you know, if, if someone says, I haven't had an opportunity to do research, um, it's kind of hard to make that case at home with, but if they say that, um, then they shouldn't apply to us and, and maybe take a year, two years, whatever, and do the NIH intramural training program. It's a great way of getting some clinical and research experience. Um, you know, there are some areas where you may need to get some certification to be an EMS or EMT, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, phlebotomist, uh, you know, that's fine. Uh, I, I see students, a lot of students this year who had clinical research coordinator positions. Um, and, and while it sounds like it's research, it's actually more clinical than anything. So um, there are ways to get around the pandemic, which has really been loosening up in terms of the access to uh, hospitals and clinical settings. But the other thing I, I should tell you, I think if someone, yeah, I know a lot of Homewood students, or the undergraduates especially, think they have to take a year off. I don't necessarily advocate that. If you're ready and every, you got all your ducks in a row, apply when you're at your strongest. But if you're gonna take the year off, do something to address whatever those holes or lapses are in your, your uh, profile. And for some people, that means getting more clinical experience. For some, it might mean getting research. We don't require research. We do for the MD, PhD, but we don't for the MD. But I know that 99% of our students have had research across the board when they come. And um, I, I think, I think that's great. I think it's great because it shows that you're an active mind. You have an active mind. You know you're used to failure. You're used to working as part of a team. Um, well, those are all important things. Um, there are a number of questions just coming in, but I think there's this one question that um, everyone here really has wants to be answered. And uh oh, that I is, think I know what it is, but go ahead now. <laughs> do JHU students, undergrad, have an advantage in getting into? Oh my uh, gosh, that's the first time I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they they have advantages and they have disadvantages. I'm going to tell you what those disadvantages are. The disadvantage is you can't say, I didn't have an opportunity to do clinical. I didn't have an opportunity to do research because you do have those opportunities. And if you haven't done them, then, you know, we, we look around and like, huh, why should we? You know, but if they've done all those things, they've taken demanding courses and they've been in Baltimore for four years, maybe longer, um, we like those students. And, you know, I, I was just looking at something before the meeting started. Um, almost every year, except for one year, I, I went back five or six years, the largest number of students in the class have been from home. You know, the, it's the largest number from, from a single institution and they're home with students. And, but, you know, it's never been more than 17 in these six years that I looked at, and it's been as small as eight. But um, last year's was 14, that's, that's like four, 11, 0.6, almost 11.7% of the class. You may think, oh, that's a small number. We accept it more than that. They don't all come. They don't have to come. We interviewed probably two times, three times that number. Um, and some got in and some did not. Some got waitlisted and some got accepted off the waitlist. You know, so, uh, but we know the Homewood students and we know the letters writers. And we know, you know, when you submit additional letters, you know, some of them I'll pay attention to others. This person always writes the same, right? Letter, but I, I love to see the letters from the committee. I, I you know I understand what they're saying, and I think they understand our program. And um, uh, I think you know we're willing to bring in the students from from home with because they're at our undergraduate institution. But an interview does not um, commit us to to admitting anyone. Okay. All right, sounds good. Um, would right. you like to continue with your presentation? Yeah, let me go through this. So I. And get through some of these. Awesome. So, so you know, you got to get to that interview stage. Remember, I said only about eleven percent are invited to interview. If you interview at Hopkins, well, the last few years it's been uh, Zoom, so I'm going to concentrate on Zoom. I have no idea what we're doing next year yet. You know, uh, the, the committee uh, will meet as a committee in uh, May, and I'll make recommendations based on 
what I'm learning from other institutions as well. But when you're invited to interview, you always have two interviews, one with a faculty member and one with a medical student, typically a fourth year, or sometimes they can be MD, PhD students who are in, in the graduate track, but they have to have um, been at least two or three, three years in the uh, medical track too. And uh, the interviewers are given complete access to your application and they have equal access uh, at equal weight in, in our, our process. And, and that's important to say because sometimes applicants will misunderstand that or misinterpret that someone who's close in age to them is not their peer in this setting, even though they may look like, and we've had um, some really unfortunate things come up in interviews um, where they've said things, inappropriate things to their student interviewer. And the students do not like that, trust me. The students are, are, are selected by their, their peers to represent the entire student body. These typically are leaders. I mean, I'm talking about people on the Senate and president of this, uh, chair of something. So they're, they're terrific people already. And so, you know, um, they want to make sure this is someone that they'd be more than happy to be a classmate of. Uh, the faculty are, you know, I, I think their interviews are great sometimes. They, they uh, aren't as thorough as the students are in, in identifying some things. The students are pretty particular. Yeah, so. Uh, so what are they looking for? Humanistic qualities, you know, passion, empathy, um, ability to work, work with others from uh, different backgrounds. And we want them to write really uh, concise, uh, accurate reports, including flaws, not just praising you. In fact, I get a little annoyed Personally, I do a lot of interviews and I'll talk about what I see or some of the shortcomings. You know, doesn't mean that person won't get in, but I think it's worth mentioning. Yeah. You know, so, and um, we put all that together and then we have a two step voting process. And every member of the committee gets to see uh, the files with associated dates of those people who are going to be discussed at the meeting, even if they didn't interview that person. They get to, to see it and they get to, to uh, enter a preliminary vote. And that vote it will establish the order of our discussion at our actual meetings. And uh, we will admit people by acclamation if they have the top scores. And then we have a lengthy list of people we want to discuss. And then after a certain point, we realize the people below that list just don't compare to the ones we just discussed. So, so uh, last year we, and I'm talking about 2024's class, uh, we accepted about, when it was all said and done, 5.1% of our applicants to the MD program, and we listed probably about 4%. The rest were denied. This year, I have no idea. Um, my guess is that it, it may be closer to 6%. That's fine. It still makes us competitive. Okay. So, and now I want to tell you about the curriculum and other degree opportunities, um, because this is what, one of the things that makes Hopkins special. We changed our curriculum a number of years ago because um, Hopkins doesn't like to do anything for, forever, you know, and, and uh, they're not static. And so we changed the curriculum because medical care was changing. We wanted to reflect that in um, the medical education. So we introduced something called Genes Society in general, and we broke up it, the curriculum into two areas, learning the science of medicine, preclinical, and then developing clinical skills. And that isn't just clinical, it actually happens during your first two years as well. So. Um, the first year you have these scientific foundations of medicine, pathophysiology, biochemistry, and so forth, anatomy, for instance, um, the gene society, it's looking at social determinants. So it's part of, you have these, you will have these translational intersections right after orientation, you have your first one looking at healthcare disparities. And you'll go for about six weeks, eight weeks of anatomy or so, and then you'll have another intersection. So the first years have quite a few of these intersections. Later on, as a second year, you have about half as many. Um, early on, we want you to develop interviewing and communication and physical diagnosis skills. Um, you'll have a longitudinal ambulatory clerkship later in your first year. At the end of your second year, which here is about February, uh, you'll have a month long course called Transition to the Wards um, to sort of fine tune those skills that you were learning about earlier in your first year. Okay, so it's really important that you know our curriculum works. Uh, we want you to have clinically relevant experiences. Um, if you're interested in other areas, which many of our students are, we want you to pursue those interests, such as other degrees. Uh, we have students who will take time off to 
pursue a master's, and in some cases, like, they'll join the MD PhD program as a first at the end of first or second year. Uh, you know, we've been successful there, and we want to integrate the basic sciences, clinical, and social sciences throughout your four years. Um, it's interesting because um, I, I mentioned that we don't require research. I'd say about 100% of our students will have had research by the time they graduate because of the things they're learning in our curriculum. 98% uh, will have a publication, peer-reviewed publication as well. And, and just about all of our students will have uh, uh, relations, uh, working relationships with faculty who advise them as well and mentor them. Now, we have a couple of tracks that you can apply to once you're at the medical school, but you don't have to. Everyone's getting the same quality education, but we introduced the primary care leadership track, uh, I wanna say about seven years ago. Um, and uh, it, it's to build on your, your, your clinical skills each year. Um, you don't have to go into primary care, you know, but it's, it's called the leadership track because we expect people to be the leaders and perhaps teach primary care. We know many of our students go into academic medicine to teach as well as see patients. And roughly about 40, 42% will do that by the time they're out in the world practicing versus 24% or so nationally. So, um, but with the primary care leadership program, it works really well. Uh, they have a three year outpatient experience in internal medicine, geriatric feeds, med feeds, which is a combination of sort of family medicine and all that. And then FM is family medicine. Uh, and their longitudinal clerkship is in, in primary care. They, everyone has to write a or, or have a scholarly concentration. It doesn't have to be written, it can be a presentation, but uh, most people will write a report and theirs would have to be in primary care, okay? So, uh, there's a, and they have the mentors, all of our students have mentors, but they, their assigned mentor would be especially in primary care. They have workshops and then they comments with a sub-I or sub-internship in primary care. Then. Uh, probably five years ago, maybe four or five years ago, we introduced the Global Health Leisure Track, which is modeled on the primary care leisure track. Interesting enough, it's actually much larger now than the primary care leadership track because it really brings in um, all the strengths that Hopkins has, not just at the School of Medicine, but also the School of Public Health. Um, and there are some areas you might think overlap, you know, if, but if someone is really interested in global medicine, um, in, you know, disease, and you know, infectious disease, uh, globally, this is a great area for them to study. So, um, you know, they're working for NGO. So it's a, it's a great program, and um, they, it provides a longitudinal experience. Their their scholarly concentration would have to be in uh, the global health area as well. And the mentoring certainly would be. Other degree opportunities, I've mentioned the MD PhD, uh, the MD MBA. Those are the two programs you can apply to directly on the AMCAS application, in addition to the MD application. A word of caution, if you're rejected for the MD, PhD, we will not consider you necessarily for the MD. Uh, in fact, I didn't consider anyone this year, over the past three years, who was an MD, PhD, who was rejected. I, I, my, you know, my feeling is if you're applying for the MD, PhD, you really want that. Okay, So uh, th there's no need to, to, to say, well, we'll consider them for the MD. Uh, I, I just don't buy it. Um, other degree or dual degree opportunities include the MPH, it's the joint degree or the truth in the industry. Um, masters in bioethics, masters in health informatics, uh, innovation and technology, education, history of medicine, and also a masters in biomedical engineering. I don't have it up there, but uh, that, that has been introduced as well. So, okay, I'm going to start right now before I talk about the, the groups on campus. Thank okay. you. All right. <laughs> yeah, so there are so many questions here. Um, and I'm trying to, to decipher them. Um, so students want to know when are they, let's say they are taking classes um, and they do not have all the necessary humanities requirements. Mm -hmm. are, will they still be able to interview and will mm -hmm. they be told at a later they time? They can be interviewed and they can be admitted. They just can't matriculate. But they're told if, the, if you're accepted and you're missing, because I review all the um, prerequisites, so if someone is admitted and they're missing a prerequisite, they'll receive a follow-up email almost instantaneously saying, this is what you're missing. Now, oddly enough, we, the, the students who will ask us, well, that, am I missing anything are the ones who didn't get the email because they were fine, you know, but 
you have until August 1st of the year you plan to matriculate to satisfy all the requirements. And it doesn't have to be at Hopkins. You know, Hopkins would like the revenue, but it can be anywhere from anywhere as long you know, as you satisfy. Okay. Um, this next question is regarding the MCAT. Um, they're just wanting to know if you super score the MCAT. No, 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 I, no. That's why I said we take the highest score from a single test administration. So that that would negate super score. Okay. All right. Uh, another question is regarding clinical experiences. So, mm -hmm. and I think you already addressed that. Yeah, uh, that is mo too. what's most important. And these questions are more so regarding the total number of hours. But I think. I, you know, I don't quantify the hours. I mean, I don't want you to think in terms of how many hours, because it's not a checklist. Um, that, that doesn't go to the, the quality of your experience if you're saying, I, I have 800 hours. Wh what did you learn? That's what I want to know. But I think you need to do more than 50 hours or whatever. Yeah, so. okay. um, what advice do you have for re-applicants? Um, two things. One is... Do not apply right away without really doing a deep dive, reflecting on your own uh, profile. Yeah, what are what are the holes? And then taking time to to fill those holes. Sometimes that means taking more courses. Uh, it may mean getting more clinical experience if you really didn't have much at all. I mean, getting some research experience if everything seemed to be fine, but um, we thought, why aren't they doing more and learning about um, failure from research so, as well as success? Okay. Um, so this student is saying, you know, as a result of COVID, there were many limitations in acquiring research or clinical opportunities. And they wanna know how does the School of Medicine consider these limitations? I, I you know, we, we understand that there were some limitations. I'm saying that at, at our medical school, we're not seeing that to the same degree that you might think because of students who are attracted to Hopkins um, will make extra effort to, to have clinical experience if that's the thing that they didn't have. And because that's, those are the folks who are gonna get it interviewed. And if someone gets interviewed who doesn't have all that, I can tell you it comes up at the meetings. Right. Do you want to continue answering questions or would you like to? Yeah, continue? sure, sure. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we're near the end anyway. Okay, perfect. Um, so this question is about when you're reviewing applications, um, the student wants to know what are some of the red flags that would cause you to um, not consider an applicant for an interview? Someone who has never had any clinical experience. I mean, that's what I'm talking about here, folks. Yeah. Um, how do you know you want to be a doctor? Um, someone whose personal statement that goes to all medical school uh, doesn't, you know, at the end of the you know, of my review of it, I'm like, I still don't know why this person wants to be a doctor. That's pretty bad. That means you don't know why. If you can't articulate that, or on our short essay questions, if you can't articulate. Uh, what areas of medicine, you know, we do ask that. I'll be honest, we ask what area of medicine are you interested in? It's not because we're gonna hold it to you, but if you've had any type of clinical experience, you should be able to say, this is what I found interesting. If you say, oh, I don't know, that's why I'm going to medical school next. <laughs> this student is interested in understanding how you factor in research for a traditional um, MD applicant as well as one for MD, PhD? Well, I, yeah, I, I don't have that much time, but I can tell you for the, the regular MD applicants, we know um, that students who are pursuing research, research are used to uh, answering questions and uh, finding solutions, uh, dealing with failure perhaps, going back to the drawing board and working with others. That's the, the importance of research that we see. The, it's not that different from the MD, PhD. They're looking for sustained, um, multiple hours, many hours of, of exposure to a lab setting and um, maybe you know, taking off on their own project uh, and getting published. A lot of our students in the MD, but especially MD, PhD, are published before they even get to the School of Medicine. 
That's great. This is one question that I, we can we consistently have as advisors, okay. and that is regarding what advice would you give an international student who is trying to get into the School of Medicine? You, if if they go to Homewood, um, or if they've gone to college in the U.S., you're, you're treated the same as anyone. We don't see you as an international student. We're a private school. We accept students from everywhere. Um, the only restrictions we have or limitations for international students are that if they haven't had a, at least a year of study in the U.S. or Canada, and this applies to U.S. citizens, by the way, too, if they've gotten a degree from uh, Oxford, great school. I mean, I'll give you that. But it's a totally different system. We require at least a year back in the States. That's the only different differentiation we make. But everyone else, you know, they have the same chance. We, we have no restrictions based on citizenship. And hmm. um, we have only set, um, actually six minutes left before. Okay, well, let me let me just show you real quick and then uh, we'll open up. These are just some of the groups. One of the things that I think that really distinguishes our students is their commitment to working with uh, different populations. And these groups, uh, there are probably a hundred. I just only have a couple of pages that just to highlight uh, some of the things they do, working Planned Parenthood, Shepherd's Clinic, HIV counseling, working with prisoners, uh, the Incarceration Health Justice Collective, um, Hopkins for Harm Reduction. So uh, our, our students are actively involved. In fact, I meet with a, a group of first years right now almost every week. And I was describing uh, some of our students uh, who come from this one institution in particular. And one of the students in the end, that actually describes us. They, can't, they came here because they can be active at, in Baltimore, not just at Hopkins, but in Baltimore. They wanna give back. And that really uh, makes these students stand out for us. I'm not saying we just admit people like that, but they, these are the ones who come here. That's what we love about it. And you can see that uh, even in terms of where they match, uh, wh where they're going for match is just amazing down the road. Um, now let me just tell you, these are some of the comments people make. Our greatest strengths are the curriculum, which we believe is, is certainly true. Um, students are really motivated. Uh, the faculty are excellent. The opportunities to work with faculty who are just, you know, national and, and international leaders is amazing. And I, I'm not talking about just four years, I'm talking about before that, uh, reputation, history, and so forth. And this is, these are some of the resources um, you should look for on the web, the MSAR, uh, the WAMC's website is great for AMCAS, and then our website, our email address, somadmiss at jhmi.edu, really important. This is where we are. And I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see you all. Um, okay, so other questions, general questions. Um, fantastic. Okay. Um, so this one question is regarding students who are accepted. They wanted to know how many of them had actual publications. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I don't sit around and, and count that. Yeah. Well, I, I guess what the question is really asking is whether or not that is heavily factored in your acceptance. No, no. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not. A, no, no. I mean, many of them have publications, but that's not the only factor. I mean, again, you're not applying to a PhD graduate program, you're applying for MD. And you know, we, we know that most of our students have had research. We care about their understanding of patient care. And that only comes from having real um, meaningful clinical experience, exposure, whatever. Absolutely, okay. Um, so this question is um, uh, regarding a student who has had mental health challenges. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to know, if, should that be disclosed? And what are your recommendations if their grades and experiences have been lowered as a result? First of all, um, we abide by federal regulations. So there's the Americans with Disabilities Act. We're, we're, you know, we have to sign off on that as well. Um, all we care about is can you fulfill the technical standards? Go to our website and they are fully uh, discussed. And uh, it's up to you. If you do want to disclose some issues, you can do that. You know, we don't reject people because they've had um, mental health challenges or emotional challenges or are different learners. I mean, we have students who come here and don't realize until they get here that they actually have had um, issues in terms of their learning style and so forth because they've always learned how to compensate. So we, we have a terrific person on our, uh, she's not on my staff, but she's in our medical education division who uh, runs a program to help 
students compensate in different ways now for any learning differences they have. We have a wellness program here. Uh, uh, we have uh, counseling available for students. It's totally private and separate from the Dean of Students Office. So you know, they can make referrals, but they won't know anything about what you need. So, but, you know, it's, it's up to you, it really is. You know. But okay. we can't help you if you don't disclose okay. at some point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this continues with the thread of research. Mm -hmm. They're wondering if there are different weights applied to different types of research. No. Next. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Um, okay. So the students, uh, this student is interested in understanding, again, red flags when it comes to um, their research experiences. And again, you just said it was open to everyone. Um, so, okay. Personalized research. There was they a question that just came in. I, that person, I think, don't, didn't understand. You, you can apply to the MD PhD program. That's a separate track. You can apply to the MD. So, you know, if I read that really quick, sorry, I think they misunderstood. Right. Um, okay. You don't just apply to the MD, you're applying to the MD PhD. We have to approve you for the MD part of it. Um, and frankly, to, you know, if you're applied, if you're accepted for the MD PhD, you still have to be approved. Um, so to speak, by the MD folks. Okay. Okay. Um, this um, question. But in terms of uh, uh, you know research and so forth, we see lots of people who've done research, and some of it isn't very meaningful. But you know, if you put that on your application, be prepared to talk about it because there are people here who do understand research. And if you can't explain yourself, that's a that's a red flag. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, we it's almost one. Okay. I'm fine. I, I, I'm not. I don't have to run off right now. I have a few more minutes if you want. Uh, Perfect. That would be great. Um, so this question is, a lot of our students have this question. They want to know if, do you provide personalized feedback for applicants who were not accepted? No. And I, you know, unfortunately, I wish we had time, but think about it. We invite 475 to interview 6,000 people. I, I can't provide feedback because it's just impossible. I think that's where we ask, you know, getting back to the, the person who asked about um, reapplicant. It, I, I'm really serious when I say, think about what, what those holes were. You know, sometimes it's, it's pretty obvious to the student. And if it's obvious to you, then it's obvious to us what, what those uh, areas uh, that warrant improvement. Um, you know, the, the, the unfortunate thing about, uh, there were a lot of unfortunate things, but when the pandemic hit, People who would have taken time off to improve their application. If either of you have Chose. questions about the exam, uh, please put your phone. We can talk about anything there. Uh, we're going to be doing. Uh, but um, th 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 those people, actually, you can mute that person. Yeah. Oh, okay. But that person exam should have. Uh, I, I am not able to. Okay. I just dropped them. Continue, please. Do you know why? I think you're muted now, Dean White. All right, how's that? Perfect. But um, you know, some people should should just think about well, what were the holes? I mean, you know, we have people applying who had like a two point one GPA. I'm, you know, we don't have cutoffs, but that's pretty unrealistic. Okay. Any medical right. school. Right. Okay, so this question is regarding um, committee letters. So this student is not eligible for committee letter based on our standards. Um, oh. And they're wanting to know if that's a disadvantage for them. I don't think it's a disadvantage if you ask the right people uh, to write your letters. But you know, it's interesting, Deidre, this just came up yesterday in really good conversation among my staff. Um, we accept, you know, if your school doesn't have a committee letter or for whatever reason, you're not eligible for that, that's fine. But if they have a committee letter, that's required. Um, my alma mater used to have a committee letter and I think did, or certainly Alex knows what that is. And then they switched to the individual letters. They're all over the place right now. Why? Because at least with a community committee letter, it was pretty focused and on point about the categories that relate to those competencies that you saw earlier. These individual letters oftentimes talk about uh, the the student in the context of their class, but don't tell us much else about the person. And, and the committee letter does a wonderful job of giving that balance. And so we really like to see that. Now, 
that doesn't mean those people with individual letters won't get in. They will get it. If anything, it just means we have to work a little harder to, 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 to read those and, and make, a, make a sense of it. All right, and I think we have just a few more questions. One okay. is um, regarding the MD-PhD timeline, they're asking if you can review that again. It's the same, it's on our, our calendar. They have by, um, it's the same deadline, no, October 15th and um, November 1st for the secondary. But trust me, those folks probably get their applications in, in that, that first go round because it's a much smaller cohort. Okay. And I think we'll end um, on this with this one question. Okay. And they're asking about, oh, is there any uh, anything positive that has ever stood out to you in someone's application that is meaningful even now or memorable? Um, yeah, no, let me tell you, I, Alex knows this and some of the other advisors know this. I actually started in admissions, it will be 43 years ago this coming June, 43 years. So I'm not going to talk about pre-Hopkins, pre you know, so, but I'm talking about at Hopkins and maybe it's because I also interviewed this person. Uh, I interviewed someone whose background was fairly disadvantaged, but he did not present himself as disadvantaged. And he was a, you know, his, his academic record was absolutely flawless. Um, and his, his MCAT scores were good. I mean, you know, competitive. Um, when we interviewed, I was shocked at how he was able to recognize uh, that he talked about his privileges and this is someone who was basically homeless at one point, and yet he saw himself as having advantages that others may not have because he was able to still uh, proceed to get his undergraduate degree in four years uh, with, and, and finally get campus housing. And I was able to become a tutor. Uh, and I love to see things like that. I mean, this is someone who is going to make a, you know, his empathy uh, and, and in terms of the people he counseled and so forth, um, just came signing through. And I think that's, that individual is going to make a great doctor. Uh, I interviewed someone, again, a few years ago, probably about 15, 16 years ago. Uh, and uh, he was pretty humble in the interview. And he got in. And then he, I saw him a few years later because I left, actually. And when I came back, he was still here. It turns out he was on our faculty. And oh, awesome. I know. And he said, you know, Dean White, I have to tell you, I couldn't believe you all would take a chance on someone like me. And I said, what are you talking about? You had a 3.9 GPA publications, service. He said, yeah, but I didn't go to a big name school. He didn't. Um, I didn't do this and that. I said, we look at the, the person. And two years later, he came to see me. Um, this is about three years ago now. And I said, what's up? He said, I just wanted to let you know I'm leaving to become chair of, and he named the, the uh, department at a major hospital out of state. Um, I was, you know, that, that's the kind of stuff that just warms my heart. It really does. And, and it's worth all the effort, you know, because it's a lot of work. And I, but I also know that not everyone's like that. Trust me. Um, some people are just good students who've done all the things they need to do. Um, and we take people like that, but it's great to see someone whose um, family was not medical in any way. Uh, he was from a Southern state and um, he got in and took a year off, traveled with his girlfriend. I think they, they had either, you know, either uh, they both had full rights or something and then came back and joined the class and was a star, just an utter star. Yeah, I mean, that was fantastic. Well, thanks again, Dean White. As always, it's a pleasure to have you present to us. Well, and I know all of our students are thankful as well. Um, and we look forward to um, having further conversations with you. And we'll be oh, sending out the recording um, in about a week or so, so that every student will have access to it. Oh, okay. And I just saw Sophia's question. And I haven't decided yet, Sophia, but I used to run the Yale Day of Service. Did you know that? Yeah, I remember you talking about it right, a little bit right, in the yeah. past. And so I was curious if you were going to do it again this year. After five years, like I passed the baton to someone else. You know? mm. <laughs> um, but um, yes, and, and, and by the way, just because I did a lot of service, that doesn't mean I, I really stressed that, but I love to see it, that's all.
All right, thank, thank you, so, you much. so much for inviting me, Ms. Absolutely. Campbell, Dr. Tan, Ms. Bowen, anyone else who's on, uh, Kayla, there you are. So thank you for inviting me once more to, to meet with your students. I enjoyed it. Great questions. You guys always make it difficult because you ask so many good questions, really. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. All right. Good night.